The only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. So says philosopher Albert Camus. Welcome to Bald Politics, where we take an alternative look at the world of politics and give a voice to the unheard. And this fortnight's edition, the focus is back on Ireland again, where we take a look at some of the legacy issues in relation to the IRA, British Crown Forces conflict from 1969 to 1997, or rather some of the issues that are not being dealt with since that time or during that time. Uh, this is in relation to uh, comments made by the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, James Brokenshire, where he decided that he would be postponing measures to deal with the past. Um, this is something that's come in from much criticism from the European Court of Human Rights, nonetheless, that says that he must implement such measures to deal with these issues, as well as locally from the Pat Finucan Centre. And I'm going to be speaking to Anne Cadwallader of the Pat Finucan Centre about that in today's show. Um, before we get to that, let's have a look at some of the significant happenings on the 21st of December. Um, in 1907, the Chilean army commits a massacre of at least 2,000 striking saltpeter miners in Iquique in Chile. In 1988, a bomb explodes on board Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Dumfries and Galloway in Scotland, killing 270 people. And in 1995, the city of Bethlehem passes from Israeli to Palestinian control. And the word control should be in inverted commas because if there's any group of people who have little or no control over their area, it is the Palestinians. Significant birthdays on this date. Uh, we have the Irish nationalist and activist Maud Gone in 1866. And we have the American talk show host and producer Phil Donahue in 1966. 35 they're the birthdays on the 21st of december so as i said this fortnight's topic i am speaking to Anne cadwallader and uh, from london is a journalist with 30 years experience of covering the war and peace on both sides of the border in ireland um and she is now a caseworker with the pat finucan center um so i caught up with Anne during the week and i asked her about the announcement of James Brokenshaw and I asked her, I put it to her initially, uh, was he not right to delay the implementation of such measures until he can of course get agreement between Sinn Féin and the DUP? Well I guess you could say that if there hadn't been at least 10 years, probably more like 15 years of discussions already um, and everybody each time the, the wheel is reinvented. First of all we had a, a long consultative process where a panel of people went all around the north and indeed some of the south talking to people about how they thought a legacy truth recovery process should look. Then you had more discussions later with uh, the US envoy Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan, Professor Megan O'Sullivan, and they came up with something very similar. And then you had the uh, Stormont House Agreement and the Fresh Start process, which again came up with very similar proposals for a unit that would be like a police unit looking at legacy issues, truth recovery in historic cases, and also another process which would be slightly more controversial, well, let's face it, a lot more controversial, which would uh, which would be a, some, an institution called the, in, the Independent Commission for Truth Recovery, which would involve uh, mediation between uh, victims' families and those people that they consider were responsible for the deaths, uh, which would not result necessarily in prosecution but that would be an entirely voluntary process. So there has been all three of these consultative processes have come up with very similar proposals. So we've been consulted to the nth degree. At this stage, what's needed is action, not more talking. All right, so what, what action can be taken? Are there, are there are some of the local parties dragging their heels? Are the DUP dragging their heels? Well, the DUP was a party to the fresh start proposals and the Stormont House Agreement. So they may try and renege or backtrack on that, but they were part of the whole consultative process that resulted in those uh, proposals coming forward. So all, all, none of, there isn't going to be agreement on the past in advance of a truth recovery process. There wasn't agreement on policing. There wasn't agreement on the release of prisoners. There wasn't even an agreement on the Good Friday Agreement, despite its name. If you wait for all the parties in Northern Ireland to agree on anything, it'll never happen. But the police is up and running. The Good Friday Agreement is up and running. Things happen eventually when politicians are dragged kicking and screaming 
into the future. But irrespective of the political uh, compulsion and the political necessity, there is also a humanitarian and an ethical necessity for people who suffered most during the conflict, that is those people who lost their nearest and dearest. There is a real mandatory uh, necessity for them to get some form of trying to find out how and why their loved ones were killed. There is also a legal necessity because the British government is a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights and they have legal obligations under that convention which they are in breach of and have been for the last two years already. So for all those reasons, for legal reasons, political reasons, humanitarian reasons, it's time to get this show on the road. A lot of the uh, cases that you were talking about are very well documented in your book, Lethal Allies. Uh, is, is that not sufficient in many ways that it's written in a book and that it's documented in that way? Uh, because the process, as you said already, has taken this long. It looks like it's going to take a bit longer. The families know, the people closer to it know what happened. Why is that extra step needed? Well, there were over 3,500 victims in the conflict, and Lethal Allies concentrates on 120. So there are all those other people. Now, many people, for example, saw loyalists and Republicans going to jail and spend long periods of time in jail, but they don't know if all the perpetrators were found, um, and there are others where nobody ever went to jail, and there are other cases where the state is suspected, more than suspected, of being involved in a covert way with, uh, with, uh, with both loyalists and Republicans because there is an inquiry into the Republican uh, agent, Steak Knife, who's believed to be Freddy Scapatici. So there are so many questions that need answering. If we can't agree about our past, it's going to be very difficult to agree on our present and our future. There's no risk-free way forward. But doing nothing isn't risk-free either. This society hasn't begun to reconcile with itself. The peace walls are still there. Segregation is still there. Housing is still segregated. Doctors, cinemas, shops, every aspect of life in Northern Ireland is segregated. And until we get some form of reconciliation, some form of listening to each other through a truth recovery process, there isn't going to be reconciliation. Is that reconciliation possible, do you think, under the current framework, um, that being Northern Ireland being within the UK? Does it stay as within the UK or part of United Ireland? Does that make any difference to reconciliation? I don't think Northern Ireland will ever be a normal society in the way that we understand a normal society because it was the result of um, a line being drawn on a map without much sense to it, other than it was a sectarian headcount. Uh, six counties in Ulster were, were, were separated from the other three counties. Well, we all know the history of that. I don't think the North will ever be a truly normal society, but I can tell you something, it can be a lot more normal than it is now. Mm. And that, that, will, that will not happen, in my view, that will not happen without a proper truth recovery process. And by that, I mean everybody must come, must come out and people who don't or organizations that don't come forward will not be easily forgiven. And it's not just the British state. It's not just the British Army. It's not just the IUC. It's also the loyalist and Republican paramilitaries. And we don't know at the moment what dynamic will emerge from a truth recovery process. We simply don't know. One thing we do know from the last 15 years is if we do nothing, there'll be no forward progress. Mm. Now, as you said in your, the book yourself, and you've mentioned in interviews as well, that this more than likely, the, particularly about your book, Lethal Allies, the, the gang known as the Glen Ann Gang, possibly went all the way to the top uh, around the time of the Miami show band explosion. The British government uh, had strong suspicions or indeed knew that the UDA or UVF were involved in what were called quote-unquote terrorist killings. If they've known about it for so long, um, even Eamon McCann himself has said that he, he doesn't believe that they're capable of telling the truth. Um, is that going to, to, to get the families or get reconciliation where it needs to be, given how far up the food chain it went in the past, right up until today? Well, I have to admit that for many, many years, for th I, was, I was a journalist in the North for 30 years covering both the war and the peace, and I 
didn't really believe that collusion was systemic. That is that it, well, I was open to the possibility that collusion was systemic and it went right to the top. But it took a heck of a lot of convincing for me to believe that it was. I'm no naive idiot. I've worked here for long enough. I've, I've, I've been suspicious and skeptical and it took an awful lot of convincing for me to believe that it was um, a systemic system. It was, it went right to the top, that it was deliberate. It wasn't just, as is often said, a few bad apples. The whole barrel was rotten. The I believe, and I know this is a lot for people to accept, it was a lot for me to accept as well. I was truly shocked and it only dawned on me over a long period of years. Um, it, it really is shocking, but I do believe that uh, quite, quite early on in the conflict, the British decided they couldn't fight on two flanks and that they enlisted the loyalists to fight the Republicans for them. It's what they've done in many previous colonial insurgency uh, theatres of war, and I believe that is exactly what they did here. If you look at it, the UDA, that's the largest loyalist paramilitary group, was legal right the way through the conflict, right up until 1992. Mm -hmm. And we know from looking at National Archive papers that throughout the conflict, the UDA was being run, manipulated and used by British military intelligence. My colleague Margaret Irwin's book, A State of Denial, um, you, once you've read that, I mean, it is pretty convincing. That is the British condemning themselves out of their own words. It's their own documents that we found. Uh, I, I can't go into detail here. I, I just advise people if they don't believe me or if they are still skeptical, and I was skeptical as well, is to uh, reach, uh, reach by, read that book with an open mind mm -hmm. and, 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 and see how you feel at the end of reading it. You know, it took me, it took me years before I believed. I mean, Lethal Allies was not an easy book to write. It was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I didn't want to write it. I didn't believe it was possible to prove collusion. Because collusion, is, in a way, is a unique crime because all you need is two people meeting together in a room. And that the, the, the product of collusion, that is bombings, shootings, etc. you can get plenty of evidence uh, on that, DNA, forensics, ballistics. But the original, I mean, it's, it's a conspiracy. In essence, collusion is a conspiracy. And all you need is two people in a room agreeing about something, and you've got collusion, you've got a conspiracy. It went much, it's much more complicated than that, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it is difficult to prove. I didn't believe it could be proven. But I do think that in Lethal Allies, we have proven it. I honestly believe that. And uh, if anybody reads it with an open mind, I believe they, 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 uh, they, get, they may be convinced as well. Okay. Now, you said in an interview that uh, most, most of your book focuses on the, the period of the 1970s, and in particular around the Glen Ann Gang. You, you said later stage that maybe in the 1980s it became more manipulated and directed. Uh, what, yes. What did you mean by that? What I meant was that in the 1970s, I only looked at collusion in one area between 1972 and 1976. If you like, I sort of, it wasn't me that picked that area. I went to work for the Pat Finucane Center and my colleagues in there had already been working on that for 10 years and they asked me to write the book on the, on the results of their research, which is, which is what I did. Um, now the people who were killed... Um, in Lethal Allies, the people whose deaths I describe in Lethal Allies, 120 people. If you take a, a, a piece of paper and you put on one side of the page people who were killed because they were extremely unlucky, they were in a bar maybe that was attacked, or they were just terribly unlucky to be caught up in a, in a mass murder attempt. Or, um, and then if you put on the other side of the page the people who were, sim who were targeted because of who and what they were, um, not one of the victims that I describe uh, in the book who was targeted was a Republican, was in Sinn Féin, was in the IRA, was active politically. These were absolutely ordinary people, shopkeepers, farmers, small businessmen. And I had to ask myself, why were these people singled out? And the answer, in a nutshell, is that if you single out Republicans, you terrify other Republicans. If you single out ordinary people... You terrify everybody. Everybody feels a target, people who have no political or paramilitary connections. And I think at that stage in the conflict, early on, I think what the British were trying to do was to 
um, persuade ordinary Catholics to lower their, na their aspirations, economic and national, and also to make them turn their backs on Republicans. It didn't work. Collusion wasn't only illegal and unethical. It also was, it didn't work. It, even on, in its own terms, it didn't work. And I do think that in the 1980s, um, they, they changed the policy. And instead of picking out ordinary people, they decided to um, target Republicans. You get an awful lot more um, Sinn Féin personnel, for example, and people who were politically active in the 1980s and 90s were killed. In the 1970s, um, I think the British were manipulating the loyalist murder gangs to kill just ordinary people. Uh, do you think, is there much awareness of this, of what happened um, in Northern Ireland, in England, in, in Wales and Scotland? Do pe does that register with people there, do you think? I don't think it really has. I mean, amongst a certain cognoscenti, as it were, amongst people who look at this closely, I think the dominant narrative of the conflict, which is that there were two irrational, savage, bestial uh, communities, Protestant and Catholic, fighting each other, and the wonderful British were in the middle trying to keep the peace between two sides. I think that dominant narrative is still dominant, um, uh, but um, it's a wrong narrative. There is an alternative narrative out there now, um, and I think gradually, as history, as we go forward, historians and history will, will validate that, uh, the alternative narrative, because more and more it's coming out. You can keep the truth hidden, but you can't keep it hidden forever. We lifted up, with our, our the two books that I've spoken about, we lifted up a corner of the carpet and people have begun to see what's underneath. Of, obviously, people have also seen uh, the evidence that has come forward about the murder of Pat Finucane, mm. uh, and the British government has admitted there was collusion in that case um, as a significant systemic collusion, and the British Prime Minister has apologised for that murder, but they haven't instituted the independent inquiry that the Nukan family want um, and one wonders why they haven't done that and the answer that I uh, unfortunately have to tell myself is that there is too much there to be exposed and they simply can't risk it and I have to say that's also the reason I think that the proposals in the Stormont House Agreement uh, and Fresh Start haven't been implemented yet because there is simply too much there too much, too many dreadful truths to come out into the open mm. for the British government to be able to bear it. Um, it would, it will expose them to international contumely. Uh, there are other people with a lot to fear as well. Obviously, the loyalists, but also Republicans. Nobody has clean hands in this conflict. Uh, the the people whose hands are very largely clean are the families of the victims, and they are the ones who are not being listened to. And it is wrong, very wrong that these proposals that could bring uh, truth to many people, not complete truth, uh, but could bring some truth and closure to people who have suffered so badly, who are now in their 80s and some of them in their 90s and are dying without hearing and finding out the truth, without acknowledgement, without somebody saying sorry. I think it is absolutely wrong that there is any further delay in bringing forward these proposals, which have been agreed by all the parties, both the British and Irish governments, uh, and are part of a solemn international treaty, and have yet to be established. And have the Irish government done anything to put pressure on their colleagues in the British government to further it, to move it along? Well, I think they probably have, actually. I'm very sceptical sometimes about... Uh, the Irish government, and sometimes it seems when they meet uh, British politicians, it's a box-sticking exercise. They make the usual demands about releasing the papers about Dublin Monaghan. But uh, recently, I do think that they realise, I think uh, Dublin gets it now. I really do think they do. I think Dublin now understands that collusion wasn't uh, a product of, of a Sinn Féin propaganda, that it, w that it did happen. Um, and I think they realise, I think they get it, that there's not going to be reconciliation in the North uh, until there there is some form of truth recovery process and I think some pressure has been put on London uh, without being in the room when these talks are going on I really don't know for certain but I do think there has been some movement from Dublin towards putting pressure on the British yes and what effect has this latest delay likely to have on the families themselves well they're heartbroken despairing we're coming up to Christmas uh, just today I was out with a gentleman who's who's whose wife was murdered in a bar in County Armagh. Um, a bomb was put in the bar. It was a bomb that we now know 
was constructed by a policeman that was placed in, in, a, in a car stolen from another policeman with explosives that were provided to the, to the gang by Yudi Yaman. Mm. We know uh, that the route was scouted by an IUC sergeant and this gentleman's wife was murdered as she worked behind the bar, the, fa- uh, the, the bar of the family pub. A four-year-old child was blown out of his cot upstairs and found standing over his mother who was lying in the rubble with her throat cut. And this gentleman is facing Christmas um, not having had any acknowledgement, not having anybody say sorry, although he now knows that the whole thing was planned, was known about, was watched, and the bomb went ahead. His wife was killed. His life was changed forever. His three sons' lives were changed forever. I mean, how, how much more heartbreak, uh, how much more contempt must these people endure? really, at the hands of, of, the, of the governments and the politicians. Uh, and that's just one story. I could tell you hundreds. These are people who have never been uh, come forward publicly to speak about their, their agony and their heartbreak, but we see them in our work, um, and they're people who's, who lives, live lives of quiet despair, frankly. Now, one thing we are doing, and we will be doing and, and next year, is we are working on a a full feature-length documentary based on Lethal Allies, which uh, has the working title of Unquiet Graves, and it is due to come out in May, being made by an independent filmmaker, so that's something. We'd, we're doing everything we can to get the truth out there, but um, we don't get a lot, huge amount of help from, from, uh, from anybody outside the North. Okay. And finally, uh, Anne, how did somebody such as yourself, with your experience and so forth, end up with the Pat Finucane Centre? Well, I, wa- I was, as I said, I was a journalist for 30 years and I knew the work of the PFC when I was, even when I was a journalist, I was quite impressed with their work. And after covering the, the conflict and then the peace, and journalism was changing and my life was changing and nothing go- remains the same forever. And I decided that um, the last few years of, before I retire, I don't know when I'm going to retire, but I will do eventually at some stage, I suppose, but I'd like to do what I always wanted to do, which is work with families who've been bereaved, um, to advocate for human rights, um, to, to, to try and have my pennyworth, I suppose. As a journalist, you reflect, you sometimes write, very rarely, but sometimes you get to write your own views down on paper and broadcast or write columns or in newspapers but I wanted to take that a, a bit further I had no plans to write the book Lethal Allies I, it, my heart sank when I joined the PFC and the first thing they asked me to do was to write a book about collusion I can tell you that was the last thing I wanted to do but I did want to spend the last few years of my career uh, working in a, in a human rights sphere and it has been one hell of a ride since I joined the PFC. I, I, I have no regrets now. I had many regrets when I was writing the book, but um, it's been very exciting and very, very worthwhile. But I must say, if, if the two governments walk away from this and the political parties walk away from this, I will be horribly disappointed. But my disappointment is as nothing compared to the heartbreak and agony that it will cause many, many, many families in the North who just want as much truth as may now be possible and some kind of acknowledgement of their loss. So thanks to Anne for her time. And if you want to know more about what they do there at the Pat Finucane Centre, just check out patfinucanecentre.org. Um, that's pretty much it from us this fortnight. Uh, we may have one more episode before the end of the year. Um, otherwise, this is the final episode of 2016. So I hope you had a great 2016. Hope it was a productive year for you and hopefully 2017 will be even more productive. Um, so if we don't see each other before then, I'd like to wish you all the best. Uh, happy Christmas. Happy New Year. So for me, Peter Carney, until then, take care. Yeah.